So since a picture is worth a thousand words, I think, um, I brought you some very short video clips and hopefully they'll work. And if they don't, I won't be able to show them to you. Oh dear. I can't tell whether it is going to work or not. Uh, well, let me go up in developmental time. No. Sorry. You'll have to believe me about the continuity of development over time. I'm not, not exactly sure why that's not working. All right. Sorry. Um, if I have time, and I, I'll, I'll go back and find another place where I can link the, those video clips to that. Um, but what I was going to show you is a little boy who uh, we measure. So uh, a couple of things to say also in response, again, to uh, Ron's really uh, excellent talk. We, um, while we do collect maternal report of behavioral inhibition and of temperament over time, really what we like to rely on um, is behavioral observation of these children over time. And what, uh, add those videos linked, I would have shown you is that um, we observe uh, the children longitudinally, prospectively over time. And when they're one and two years of age, we present them with a whole host of novel events, including an unfamiliar adult person and a tunnel that they are asked to crawl through and a robot that approaches them. And then at four and at seven, um, actually in collaboration with Ken Rubin, we, um, in this particular study, we did a quartet in which we saw our target behaviorally inhibited child uh, along with three unfamiliar uh, same age, same sex peers um, in social interaction. And we code um, the child's behavior and um, using uh, Ken's uh, play observation scale, um, we identify those children who are high in what uh, we've described as social reticence, which is really on-looking, unoccupied behavior, watching the other children um, as they go about playing in the room, um, as the three other children play and our behaviorally inhibited children is off on the side. Okay, so uh, what accounts for the emergence and stability of anxiety amongst behaviorally inhibited children? What I'm going to argue, um, and perhaps in some sense then address the, one of the fundamental questions that Ron raised in his talk, is that there are uh, differences among behaviorally inhibited children in attention processes that appear to moderate the relation between temperament um, and disorder. And I'll, I hope to show you that in some of the data that we have collected. But in order for uh, me to do that, I want to describe for you a number of different ways and a number of different aspects of attention that we have studied in our behaviorally inhibited children. And that includes threat appraisal, bias to threat, conditioning and learning or paying attention to threat in the environment um, and error monitoring. Um, now the study design that we've been involved in for some time um, involved first uh, recruiting a large sample of children who were, um, uh, who answered uh, an ad or a letter that we sent out randomly to uh, uh, parents and families uh, in the geographic area of College Park. And we brought these children into our laboratory and we presented them when they were four months of age with a set of novel auditory and visual stimuli. Um, and then we laboriously coded um, the child's uh, response to those stimuli, both in terms of their facial expressions, their vocal expressions, and their motor activity. And we selected those children who showed a high degree of negative affect and motor activity, and they had to meet two criteria in order to be selected. And those were the kids who um, we identified as being uh, uh, those behaviors, at least, as being precursors for the development of behavioral inhibition. We next saw those selected children 
at 14 months of age when, uh, as I described to you earlier, we saw them and observed their behavior. Again, at 24 months of age, and this is where we saw them with the unfamiliar adult and with the tunnel and the robot. And then at four and at seven years of age, um, we measured social reticence uh, in this uh, peer group, uh, the quartets, where they were, the targeted child was placed with three other children and observed in social interaction. But really the data that I'm going to be presenting today link that earlier um, observed behavioral inhibition that uh, I've just described to you to outcomes that we've uh, collected um, at, in early adolescence between the ages of 14 to 16 years of age and that's when we did this particular psychiatric screen. Okay, so here's our sample just in case uh, um, anybody's interested in the details. About half male and half female um, and they're the ages that you saw that we uh, saw them in the assessment. Okay, so first a few words about uh, attention. What do we mean by attention and what are the different aspects of attention that we're interested in in terms of uh, measuring? So uh, we approach attention by first understanding that attention is capacity limited. That is, if you're paying attention to something, there are some things that you uh, can pay attention to or will pay attention to and there are other things perhaps in the periphery or perhaps even uh, right directly in front of you that you're not going to attend to um, as, uh, as carefully. And uh, also by uh, attention being capacity limited, I also mean to say that there are some things that will draw your attention more than other things. The other thing to say about that is that stimuli, as I just mentioned, compete for processing and are selective. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in just a second. And the fall, final thing is, and I'll go into some detail about this uh, in the talk, is that there are both top-down and bottom-up processes that are involved in this competition for processing of selected stimuli. Uh, and the top-down means uh, how you go about selecting stimuli, and the bottom-up is in terms of the capture uh, or the orienting towards particular stimuli. Okay. The final thing to say about that is that threat stimuli uh, play a critical role in both the selection and the capture of stimuli and that, that's true particularly for uh, individuals with anxiety disorders and as I'll hope to show you for our children with behavioral inhibition. Now where does this all, uh, how does this all link to um, the fields of attention in neuroscience. Well, uh, Joe Ledoux, who is a neuroscientist uh, currently at uh, New York University, published a paper some years ago um, in which he presented a model of uh, attention capture, particularly has, as it has to do with threat. So up there in the top right corner, you can see an individual uh, walking through the woods, having themselves a jolly old time, and there, I don't know if you could see it, but at the bottom down there, there's a snake that the person is about to see, um, and that if they didn't see, that they may have in fact stepped on. So what happens when that individual sees this snake, and presumably sees this snake as a threat? Um, what Ledoux outlined there is that there are two pathways. That the, that the brain uses to attend to and to process that threatening stimulus. The first pathway is what Ledoux called a fast uh, attentive pathway. So that's from your eyes up there, up to the visual thalamus, and then down to a, a small structure that's in the midbrain called the amygdala. And it's a fast pathway, and the way Ledoux uh, showed this to be a fast pathway is you can see that you don't exactly see it as a snake, it's somewhat of a degraded image on this uh, schematic diagram, right? So you see it very quickly, this is very fast acting pathway, and it lets you know that there's a threat in the environment. And in fact, Ledoux um, has written about how the amygdala is in fact a very important brain structure that's associated with the detection of threat in the environment.